This broadcast is brought to you by All I Need to Know About Success, I Learned from Star Trek by author Glenn Henderson. To get your copy, go to glentrekbook.com. My name is Owen Carter, SciFiction.com. How are you doing today, Jefferson? What is your role in this awesome as Hellboy goodness, The Crooked Man? Uh, so I play a character named Tom Farrell. So when he was a young man, Tom Farrell fell in love with a witch, and he made the terrible decision to sell his soul to the devil for a lucky cat bone. And now, 20 years later, he's come back to his hometown to try to get his soul back from the devil. And he very luckily runs into Hellboy and Bobby Joe. So you're the crooked man. Okay. No, no, I, I sold my soul to the crooked man, and I'm trying to get my soul back from the crooked man. Wow, that's, that's wild, man. That's amazing. Was there any practical effects on scene that got you? Like, because this is a very scary film, and yeah. we're told that there's a lot of practical effects. Yes. Was there a specific scene, without spoiling anything, that got you rattled, or you were like, all right, that one's going in the nightmare chamber? Oh, yeah, there were tons. <laughs> Almost all of the effects were practical, and the prosthetics were amazing. So Martin, the actor who played the crooked man, we would only really see him in costume. If you're wearing this level of prosthetics, you come in four or five hours before everyone else to get that work done. It takes a long time off in a separate area. So we, for two and a half months, I didn't really see Jack Kessie. I just saw Hellboy. And I didn't really see Martin. I just saw the Crooked Man. And it's such an, the Crooked Man particularly is such a skin crawling, uncomfortable presence. And Martin's performance is so, it's very physical. It's a very physical, strange posture. Yeah, I found it very unsettling. Um, and my character is terrified of his character, so it worked out great. It, it really worked out just perfect. Exactly. It really feels like there's this terrible gravity. And the first time the Crooked Man shows up, there was this sequence where he's just sort of walking towards us from like 50 yards away. And he's sort of outside the light and he's sort of slowly getting closer. You know that shot, I think it's in Skyfall where Javier Bardem is like walking towards Daniel Craig. It really felt like that. It was just this like, oh, he's getting closer and closer and closer. It was very uncomfortable. I know, exactly. It's excruciating, yeah. So you said you've read the graphic novel. Yeah. Is there anything that you read from the characters that you're like, all right, this is going to inform my performance, or did you want to try to come at it at a different angle? It's a little bit of both. You know, the script is so faithful to the graphic novel that everything is kind of inherently informed by that. You know, like the, the character in the film is experiencing almost exactly what the character in the graphic novel experienced. What I did love is you get a real sense from the illustration of the character and the way he's written in the graphic novel. He's really, I think Brian described him as like a, oh, it was such a good description, like a cat with a long tail in a room full of doors. It was like a very, he had this amazingly vivid description. It feels like Tom in every direction, things are coming to get him, you know? Like things are coming through every crevice at the edge of the frame to, to swallow him up, you know? And so he has to kind of always keep his head on a swivel. And that was really easy on our set because the, the environments were so richly created. The performances were so vivid. It felt like my job was just to stay open to everything around me and try to stay aware of everything in the room. And that did a lot of the work for me. Yeah, yeah. So, in, because you've read uh, the story, what was it when you're looking at Richard Corbin's art that made you just, um, like you were excited to see recreated in real life? I mean, it really is that character, the Crooked Man, and Effie Kolb. Like, it's such a strange, she's such an interesting contradiction in that book because she sort of looks like a young woman, but she's like an ancient evil witch. In the book, she's... There was a really lovely description in the screenplay of her flying away, just kind of the floating. And all of those sequences, you read them on the page, you see them in the book, you're like, how the fuck do you do this in the movie? Like, how do you possibly do this in the movie? And the actor who played Effie Kolb is this, this actor, Leah McNamara, who's an incredible Irish actor. Uh, and she had to do some shit. I'm on a show called Yellowstone. That's a, a cowboy show. So we work with horses a lot. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for working with horses. I've done it a ton. I know how hard it is. She had to do this sequence where she rode in on the back of a horse with a wire attached between her and a tree. She had to get off the horse, move around the horse, kind of, people who've read the book know the horse has a special significance. She had to kind of work her way around the horse and sort of dance with it a little bit and then fly away. And that is an incredibly challenging thing to do with a real live animal. We're talking about a real horse here. They hate wires, they hate boom poles, they hate light stands. Uh, so all of her movement really came right out of the book. There's an incredible 
sort of chilling sequence in the book too where she's sitting in a tree branch and Leah also had to do that, sit on a tree branch hooked up to a wire so she could fly away from it. And she was so amazing at like being, it's weird as an actor when you're tied into all this stuff, you're thinking about all this stuff, you're thinking about, okay, three, two, one, here comes the pole. You have to be really ready for all this technical stuff. And Leah was so amazing at staying so present and in the moment and so focused even while all this other shit is going on. Yeah, she's amazing. Her and Martin both, I wish they were here today because they really bring the movie to life. Those characters, I feel like the Crooked Man and Effie Kolb are both such vivid characters in the book and those performances, I'm, I'm excited for people to see them. Can't wait. So now, Cheers. about that moment in the screenplay yeah, yeah. with the horse and the significance yeah. of it, what was your reaction when you read that in the screenplay and that was revealed to you? It's so strange. It's such an interesting, it's a very Hellboy moment because I feel like Hellboy always combines humanism and like these really real sort of deep primal feelings with the fantastic in a really unique way. You know, there's all these contradictions. Like he's a very human compassionate character and crazy shit is going on. There's demons and all this. So that, that I feel like that image that I'm excited for people to see is really an expression of that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's really an expression of that uniquely Hellboy feeling. First off, how's your Comic-Con going? Well, tell us about this Hellboy film. It's awesomeness. Comic Con is going great. It's my second time around here. Um, it's been a while. First time was with uh, Guillermo del Toro for The Strain. Um, I was just a little young buck then. Um, some time went on, and now we're here with Hellboy. So there's some connective tissue. Um, it's been fun. It's been nonstop. Not a lot of time to myself, but uh, it's exciting to see everyone so excited. It, it, it gets me excited. So it's awesome. Very cool. What was it like for you when you saw yourself first becoming help? Surreal. Um, disbelief. Surreal. Um, Nerve-wracking slightly. Just how are we going to tackle this? Uh, it's because it's a one-off experience, right? You don't ever, not, how, how often do you put on a full prosthetic suit and all the, all the jazz and act in it every day, right? It's, it was, but I didn't, I didn't give it too much thought because now I get lost in my head. I just took it one scene at a time, one day at a time. And uh, I'm always up for a challenge, so it was challenging, and uh, I'm super grateful I did it. I'm happy it came my way. Yep. Have you taken anything from the previous actors who have played Hellboy <laughs> and kind of taken away of like what to do and what not to do? It's a good question. Um, I honestly have only seen uh, Del Toro's first Hellboy, and it wasn't in intentional or not, just the way it worked out. But uh, up to when I, you know, got the part. And, you know, there was a debate with like, do I want to go watch it? Do I want to not? Because every time I, you know, the process for me is different with every film. And then when I read it and I read the dialogue, I said, I know exactly what to do with this. Not to sound cocky, but like it just came off the page. It's like very close to uh, kind of my personality. I like to chain smoke. I like to be a wise ass. So I was like, this is going to be good, man. I was like, I got this. You look at it and it's like, Yeah. Yeah, the soul. So, no, to answer your question, um, no, it's, it was a new thing. We pulled straight from the comic book. I look at the page. You know what? And if I know what to do with it, I'm just going to just tackle it, you know, one page at a time. And with the collaborative spirit of the VFX people and the prosthetic people and the director. So, um, yeah, that's how I approached it. Yeah. It seems like Mike uh, you know, is very involved in, in this particular adaptation, so um, did you ever have any kind of uh, run notes with him or kind of just uh, have kind of one-on-one -on -one time with him to just talk about embodying the, the, the creation? Of uh, honestly, no. Um, I know director Brian Taylor and him were working behind the scenes like day to day. He was looking at the dailies every day. Um, and they were kind of shaping the script and then me and the director kind of worked on the dialogue a little bit where we could kind of stick it to the 50s a bit, find some vernacular, find some words. That's that's what I like to do. I like to find specificity and like really challenge production. Like, why not we, we, they would wear the bracelet this way or he would say this in this situation. This is what they used to do in 1958. They were open to that collaboration. So that was my input in that sense. But. Mike was definitely involved with the director and looking at dailies and um, given that it was pulled directly from his comic book, almost frame by frame outside of like uh, the Bobby Joe character and a couple of scenes stitched together it was directly from uh, the comic book. So a lot of the road work was done for us, you know. 
you've done the film is set you mentioned in the 1950s yeah. to get that aesthetic did you look in anything 50s ask or what kind of stuff did you kind of do uh, yeah i love doing that stuff music uh style walk um just just what would a young man uh, uh behave like you know like every generation has its has its thing you know so definitely looked into a uh, slang right style um because uh, this is a younger version of Hellboy, so he's more of maybe a less confident Hellboy, a more vulnerable, reluctant hero, wants to be the young man at the party, picking up the girls, but, you know, it's a little tricky for him, you know? <laughs> you know? So, yeah, yeah, definitely did some homework and some research on the 50s. and uh, Awesome. My, uh, this question's for my son, actually. Okay. Huge Hellboy, read all the graphic novels, cool. huge Hellboy fan. So what nuances and smaller details did you find in the screenplay that helped you tap into Hellboy? Yeah. That made, made you know, okay, this is who this character is, and this is how I want to play over there. Any specific nuances that you found in the screenplay or in the reading of the script that helped you get into the character? I think his almost jadedness of his job of like almost summoned to do this field of work and he's just so over it and like oh wow yeah, exactly i really love that because it's almost like getting up for work we could all relate to that sometimes and he's just he's no bullshit kind of guy you know it's not like oh my he's just uh-huh you know kind of I, I get that very well so yeah that little idiosyncrasy and, and definitely smoking like he had him smoking in the 50s i still like to smoke you know so I was like, this is going to be fun. No smoke breaks right there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this isn't your first comic book film. You played a character in Deadpool. Oh, yeah, a little something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you see yourself maybe getting, maybe getting into another comic book adaptation or anything like that? Hey, my phone is uh, here. I'm waiting for the calls. Yeah, <laughs> is there any sure. like particular character that you're like, I want to I do this Cyclops or, or, or anything like that that you can name? I would love to get a crack at Joker one day on a different spin or Gambit, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that's one day, hopefully. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Challenging, you know, but that would be cool. Yeah. That was like uh, uh, built on a lot of, a lot of mythology. Yep. And a lot of, draws from a lot of worldly mythologies. Was there, is there a myth out there that, you know, um, sticks with you uh, as far as something that's either either haunting or something that is a favorite of yours? As far as in, in related to Hellboy or in life? Just in life. And just, I'm not sure. That's a tough one. Um, Mythology, man. I'm not. I'm not really schooled on mythology that well, to be honest with you. Well, how about the Hellboy? For Hellboy, you know, I've learned a lot on the job with Hellboy, and there's so many superpowers he has that I wasn't even unaware of. Like, apparently, he could even take flight with wings. So, I would love to see. Yeah, obviously, we didn't accomplish that in this one. Not to like blow a spoiler or anything, <laughs> but just. There's so much more to him than even, I don't know, I mean, obviously the hardcore Hellboy fans probably know, but I was learning on a job, like picking Mike's brain, and even Hellboy fans who write, they're like, ah, check this out, look at that. So I learned on the job through the fans and through research, you know, because I wasn't a big comic book guy growing up. I dabbled. So when this came across, it was like, I was totally in a new world. So I was learning on the job. Owen Cotter, SciFiction.com. I got to ask you a question. This Hellboy being like, you had a few other Hellboys before, how does it differ from the other Hellboys that's come before that? Um, I just, I, this one specifically is based on the Crooked Man, so the actual comic book. So for us, maybe that is the biggest difference in that it's um, really tightly knit with the story. So I think we really just tried to bring what was on the page uh, to life. And we're really excited and happy, of course, that we have Mike Mignola with us, who um, got to do that in co-writing the script. The toy also. Curious quick question. Did you read The Crooked Man uh, before you did it, and how did you like it? Yes, of course. I was actually just saying it. It was, in fact, the first comic that I'd ever read of Hellboy. I know. Yeah. But I uh, loved it. I genuinely loved it. It was amazing. I... Um, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Awesome. I feel like for 
Bobby Joe, a lot of it was because she's kind of going on this journey of discovery in itself. Like she's so new to everything. I no, I don't think I pulled anything. It was you know she's an Asian American character that's set in the 50s, and I thought it was really cool that her background growing up in Europe, I got to play a character like that, and I felt like she was that was unique to her. Director, creator, Hellboy, the crooked man here at San Diego Comic Con. Tell us a little bit about what your uh, guidance is, how you got into getting into this role. I mean, like to create these films. Uh, do you want to start? I'm going to let you take okay. this one. Um, well, when they asked me, uh, when they told me they were making another Hellboy film, I said, uh, let's do the crooked man. If you want me involved in any way, um, it's got to be the crooked man, which is my favorite Hellboy story. Um, has all the best Hellboy elements, I think. It's a solid story. Let's do that. If you don't want to do that, then I won't be involved because you know this is the fourth time doing a Hellboy film, and I wanted to see if we could get one that was actually more faithful to the subject matter. Awesome. And your role in this is what? Like, can based on that? Well, I directed the movie. And, uh, you know, so when I came into it, uh, there was already a script from the creator of the character, which was really exciting to me because because I know we're going to do the real deal. This is not some uh, studio reiteration or very, you know, kind of some kind of like uh, they're, they're not mucking up with it too much and we're not going to let them muck up with it. So from the beginning, my thing was like, let's just keep this as true to the original source materials we possibly can. And um, and we're going to we're going to go to war for that. What are some of the influences that led to the creation of Hellboy? Oh, going way back. Um, I always wanted to draw monsters. It's really as simple as that. I had done 10 years of stuff for Marvel and DC. I actually made up a Batman story that was a supernatural story. It was the first, you know, sort of writing I had done on a comic. And when it came off that, I went, wow. It's cool being able to do my own stuff. I'm not a, really a superhero artist. And I thought if I could do stories like this with my own character, then I'd really have it made. But I didn't want to draw a regular person. I wanted to draw a monster. So it was like a regular dude who just happens to be red with a tail, which I thought was just hilarious. Um, and that was it. It was really simply an excuse to see if I could get away with drawing monsters for a living. And, uh, you know, it, it worked out. And then little by little over the years, you kind of figure out, well, who, who is this guy? Awesome. All right, and my question for you. Okay. So he wants to know, with the art style of Hellboy, it's so distinct, it's so unique with the, with the shading under the eyes. How hard was that? How hard was it to convey that on film? Because, of course, switching from the paper to the screen is a challenge in itself. But with such a distinct style, what was, how did you attack that? Right. So, well, we, we were trying to adapt the original book as close as we could. And it's a, it's a horror story. It's a folk horror story. So we were making a folk horror movie. There was no doubt about that. So it's a, it's a movie movie with uh, you know dark things in the woods and uh, and when witches and uh, you know creepy cabins and things like that yeah yeah so that that's the world we're in so you know it's gonna be dark you know there's gonna be a lot of black ink on that page and so we put a lot of black ink on the screen and try to just you know light it and shoot it as moody and uh, sort of uh, as dark as the original as the original books awesome. Now, his follow-up question, with Ron Perlman relying heavily on practical effects and David Harbour's movie relying heavily on CG, what was your, when you got handed this film, which one did you want to go with, practical or CG? Well, this all comes from the, this all comes from the story, right? So I didn't look at it as we're doing, like, I didn't look at it as we're rebooting Hellboy or we're doing some new take on Hellboy. I looked at it as adapting a story, the same way you would adapt a Stephen King story. You're adapting a classic story by, uh, by a master creator, and we're going to do it as close and as authentic as we can. And so the story sort of lets you know what it wants to be. Because this was a more indie, grounded, kind of like creepy uh, horror iter iteration of the, of the character, I mean... That's you want to have more practical effects if you can because it feels good. You know you don't want to you don't want exotic you know purple monsters with twenty tentacles. You want it to be sort of real animals that really could be in the woods, but they're just bigger and weirder. Um, so so everything was sort of just inspired by the material, and we did as much practical as we could. This question is for Brian. What was it about this story that you looked at and was like, I have to direct this. I want to put my take on, on this character. Uh, 
Well, so, so, okay, so my approach to it was less that, like, this is going to be my take. Because to me, this is, this is, this is Mike's take. You know, and, and I really honor that. You know, I have a lot of respect for original creators. It's a thousand times harder to invent something than it is to riff on it or, you know, create some variation on it, right? So we had a script here generated by the man, by the Don, right? The real deal. So, so your approach there is real simple. And it's like, we're going to execute this. We're going to get this close to the original as we can. And that's an exciting thing. Yeah. There's... Um what was it about Brian's work that you're like, okay, this is the guy who yes. wanted to adapt? I wish I could say that I handpicked Brian, but I actually had no no say in that one. But I made my peace with it pretty quickly, despite Ghost Rider. And uh, hey, hey. What made you get to that point to, to make your peace with it? No, it was, it was actually discussing things oh. with Brian. I mean, Brian not only wanted to stick to my material, but uh, a lot of the, the Crooked Man story was inspired by a writer named Manly Wade Wellman who wrote Appalachian folklore uh, type stories. And he brought in, I said, why did you change this name? He goes, oh no, I, that, I got that from Manly Wade Wellman. So I said, not only does he love this material, but he loves the material that inspired this material. So I felt like we're on the same page.